Uh, thank you everybody for attending today. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to be a little bit biased because I deal with uh, dairy manure mostly. Um, so all the information I'm presenting is going to be related to emissions from composting of dairy manure. And I'm also going to hit a little bit on some field application studies that we have as well. So uh, we are out in the Pacific Northwest. We're a pretty dry area. Um, so most of our dairies are composting manure that are either coming from dry lots or they could be manure that's removed from settling basins or from solid separation systems. And our composts tend to be pretty low in nitrogen, only about 1.2% is what I've found on average and about 13% carbon. Uh, this is because a lot of our nitrogen is already lost from the system before we get the manure to the composting process. And there's also quite a bit of soil and sand sometimes in our manures. And so that kind of drives that carbon content down a little bit. So it's not what a lot of people would think of when they think of composts. So what are the reasons that our producers are interested in composting? The most Probably important reason is it's a really great way to reduce the volume and the weight of your manure so that you have the ability uh, to transport it farther than you would normally. And so the different types of manures lots of times are um, composted in different methods. Uh, so the most common methods that we usually see out here are either static piling, which is where they'll just leave the manure in a pile, uh, over winter, throughout the summer, they don't turn it or anything. Then you'll have producers that will have compost in piles, but they'll turn those piles on a regular basis, usually with a tractor or other uh, equipment like that. We do windrow composting, like you see here on the left, where we have the manure in long strips, and we use they use special turners to turn that compost on a regular basis. And then you can also see some silo or vessel composting, which we don't have a lot of here. I have seen it with uh, other manures in the past though, where you've got the manure in an enclosed container and is continuously being mixed and you're able to really highly control the temperature and aeration uh, of that compost during the composting process. So if we look at where are emissions coming from within the composting cycle, right? Our manure is mostly consists of organic carbon con compounds, organic nitrogen compounds uh, with some ammonium in there. And so the main things that we lose that I'm gonna talk about today are ammonium, which is due to uh, changes in pH when you're in the ammonium form, as you drive that pH up, you can lose ammonium. Uh, as these organics break down in an aerobic environment, you get CO2 formation. As organics break down in an anaerobic environment, you can get methane formation, particularly from the thanogens, as well as a little bit of CO2. And then that nitrogen is it's being mineralized and it goes through the nitrogen cycle and nitri nitrification and denitrification, you can lose N2O uh, during that denitrification process. And so those are the main processes that are controlling uh, the gaseous emissions that we see from composting. So I'm going to talk a little bit about these two studies that we did where we were looking at on-farm measurement of ammonia, methane, and nitrous oxide from composting and dairy manures. Uh, these were two different dairies, both open lots. One was a 10,000 cow dairy, the other one was closer to about 2,000 cows. And so all this manure was scraped from the open lots and windrowed, um, and that's how they were doing their composting process. So at the large open lot dairy, we were trying to get emission measurements every month during uh, the time that the compost was in the compost yard. And at the smaller dairy, uh, we were getting seasonal measurements. Unfortunately, we started that study in October, so we were kind of late in the composting process. And then we made it to the spring and they decided not to compost anymore. So that's the danger of doing on-farm research. So that study was cut a little bit shorter than we were hoping it was gonna be cut. So some of the things to note is we do, especially in the warmer months, you tend to see pretty strong diurnal changes in your emissions. So emissions tend to be lower around midnight, early in the morning. As the temperature increases, wind speed increases, these emissions tend to increase. 
at least these are the trends that you would see for ammonia here. You can see it increases, goes back down, and it kind of follows that daily cycle. We see the same with methane emissions and with CO2 emissions. When we look at nitrous oxide emissions, on the other hand, they tend to be a lot more sporadic and they really don't tend to follow really good diurnal cycles. Uh, this, I'm not sure if this is an artifact or not, uh, but in this case, we did end up with higher emissions kind of early in the morning. And I'm not sure if that is due to, you can see here as the microbial activity is increasing, you're generating CO2, uh, we may be creating some anoxic pockets within that manure pile, uh, that compost windrow, and maybe that was the thing that was spurring these nitrous oxide emissions, but we didn't investigate that thoroughly. So overall on the dairy, um, this is methane here, emissions in pounds per day on the top left, nitrous oxide emissions, CO2, and ammonia emissions. Uh, and as you can see, for ammonia emissions, it was a little bit quiet in the spring when they first put the manure out. As temperatures increased, uh, then we started to see increases in ammonia emissions. And then again, after you got through the hotter periods and a lot of that nitrogen was lost, emissions went back down. And during June here, you can see these large spikes in all the emissions. That was because uh, they were actively turning the piles during some of our monitoring events. And you could see that as the piles were being turned, you were getting these big spikes of emissions um, from all the different gases. So methane emissions kind of was a little bit higher in the beginning, went down. We were seeing some spikes here when they were turning, uh, but then kind of went down again towards the end of the year. You kind of saw the same thing with nitrous, a little bit higher when they first put the manure out there, and that might be just because it was a little bit wetter at that point, and then maybe dried down, but then definitely when you were turning the manure, you were getting spikes. And CO2, again, kind of increased as temperature went up and then went back down with these same spikes in emissions. So I tried to put this on a, a pounds per animal unit per year, just to get an idea of what an emission factor could look like. Uh, so in this case, the ammonia was about 4.6 pounds per animal unit per year. The methane was 38, nitrous oxide 2.6, and the CO2 close to 1,500. So on the small dairy, again, we had started in the fall, so it was quite a bit warmer. Emissions were high at this point, relatively speaking. Uh, then we went into winter and emissions dropped dramatically for ammonia, the nitrous, and the methane. All three dropped. Uh, then in the spring, when things started to warm up again, we saw a rise back in the ammonia emissions and a little bit of activity in the nitrous, but the methane uh, just never did anything again after that. And then at that point, they had come and cleaned out the compost yard. And what he had told me was that his neighbors were interested in, in taking his manure at that point, and he didn't feel it was worth the energy that they were spending um, turning the piles in order to compost it as opposed to just delivering it to their neighbors as raw manure. So again, you can see that temperature is a really big driver of emissions. And of course, as you get later throughout the composting process, you're going to get a drop lots of times in these emissions. And so the emission factors, I tried to for both of these, you know, I tried to figure out what they would be across the year using average temperatures for the different months and kind of applying the emissions that we saw based on that. So it, we would end up again with about 4.7 pounds of ammonia loss, 9.6 methane, and 9.4 in nitrous oxide. At that particular dairy, uh, the smaller open lot dairy, we were also looking at emissions on the whole farm. And this just gives you an idea of what the compost emissions look like in terms of the whole rest of the emissions from the facility. And you can see over here on the left, this is pounds emitted per gallons of milk. I, in this case, we put it on a gallons of milk basis. Um, and you can see that the methane creates the biggest amount of emissions on the farm in terms of pounds, followed by the nitrous here with the lots being the largest source. Uh, for methane, the settling basin was actually the second largest source. Then you get down to the compost and some of the young cow housing in the lagoon. The nitrous oxide, on the other hand, the compost was the second largest source of nitrous oxide emissions on the farm.
And although these nitrous oxide emissions don't look like they're really high numbers, by the time you convert it to a global warming potential using the 100 year numbers, uh, you basically end up with about a 50-50 split on this farm for their overall global warming potential footprint being from methane and nitrous oxide. And the compost ends up contributing about 35% of that total global warming potential on this farm. So when you are handling a lot of your manure as a solid, uh, this really can add to the overall global warming potential and the carbon footprint of your facility due to the losses of carbon uh, through ammonia and nitrous oxide. And that of course is not accounting for CO2. So just some other studies that I found interesting. Um, this is actually a study that I thought about not including, this was supposed to be a study that looked at either storing manure as a slurry, a static pile, or a turned pile. And in this particular case, we were first trying to look at the effects of diet on manure composition and how that may affect losses of carbon and nitrogen during the storage period. Um, we did not see any effect of diet, so this ended up being an average across all the dietary treatments. But unfortunately, um, the amount of manure that we had for our static pile and our composted pile uh, was not really large. Um, and there, and at that time, we also had extremely hot temperatures. So unfortunately, my static pile was okay. But when we were turning the pile that was supposed to be compost, it pretty much dried out instantly. So it did not really represent true compost. However, there are producers that will dry their separated solids and other um, parts of their manure system fairly quickly. So I thought I would just show this because it was interesting to see how much of a difference it made drying that manure quickly as opposed to leaving it in the static pile. So if we look at the static pile, uh, we were lo losing about 50% of the total carbon uh, throughout that storage period and about 45% of the nitrogen. Um, but when we turned that pile and we dried it really quickly, we saw about a 28% decrease in the amount of carbon that was lost and about a 20% uh, decrease in the amount of nitrogen that was lost. So I guess if you're looking to conserve carbon and nitrogen and you have the ability to dry your manures out pretty quickly, uh, that might be a good practice to try and reduce those losses. So here's a study that did what I was actually trying to do. So in this case, they were looking at beef feedlot manure, and they had a lot more manure to work with. And they were looking at the effects of either stockpiling that manure and leaving it as is, not touching it, versus a compost row where it was being turned on a regular basis. And they were looking at emissions of ammonia, nitrous oxide, CO2, and methane. And you can see up here on the top is the ammonia losses. And when they did not touch that pile, the ammonia losses were a little bit at the beginning and then they just pretty much leveled out and didn't do much throughout the rest of the composting process. When you turn that windrow, you got uh, a pretty big burst of ammonia emissions during the composting process and then those kind of reduced over time probably because it lost all the nitrogen, um, reactive nitrogen that it was going to lose and kind of petered out over time. But if you look at the cumulative losses, you can see that by turning that pile, they generated quite a bit more ammonia emissions than when that pile was left static. Same kind of trend was seen with the nitrous. Uh, the stockpiled manure had very low to no emissions at the beginning, kind of went up a little bit at the end, whereas when they were aerating that pile and turning it, uh, they ended up with a pretty big bump of nitrous oxide emissions kind of around 75 to 100 days into the, the storage process. And when you looked at the cumulative emissions, there was quite a bit more nitrous oxide lost uh, from that turn pile than from the static pile. The carbon, on the other hand, was a different story. This was quite interesting, actually. You can see when the static pile was left, um, carbon dioxide emissions kind of dipped at the beginning, but then at the end, and I'm guessing maybe this is as the pile slowly dried out over time, you did start to see some of the CO2 being released due to microbial activity. Whereas when they were turning the pile, you got a good flush of CO2 kind of at the beginning, and then a little bit more later down to about nothing. So in the end, they ended up releasing similar marks of CO2, but they just released them differently throughout the composting process. The methane, on the other hand, for the compost row kind of steadily went 
down to nothing over time, whereas when they left the pile alone, they had a bump kind of early at about 50 days. And then as the compost sat there longer, they had a larger flush of methane uh, later in the period. And overall, you ended up losing more methane uh, from that stockpile than they did from just the, the windrowed pile. And this year, there was this meta-analysis done. Again, this is looking at dairy manure composting in particular, done by Ba et al. Um, they were looking at basically the effects of management on the emissions of ammonia, methane, nitrous, and CO2. So they looked at the four different types here. So they looked at a static pile, mechanical turning, but in a pile, windrow, and then silo or vessel composting. And for the ammonia emissions, turning the pile and constantly agitating it in the silo generated the most ammonia emissions followed by a static pile. And in this case, their windrow um, pile did not generate a lot of ammonia emissions. And I'm not quite sure why that was. Um, so it's quite a bit different than what was shown in the Canadian study with the beef cattle feedlot manure. Methane emissions, again, were greater when you disturbed the pile in this case. Uh, and windrowing, they were the least in the silo, um, but the silo is constantly being mixed and aerated, so maybe there's less buildup of anaerobic conditions, which reduce the amount of methane being produced. For CO2 emissions, similar again, anytime that the pile was disturbed, you had greater emissions out here versus static piling. And the silo was kind of a big variation, um, but not quite as high as turning in the windrow. So they tried to add all these up and looked at the total CO2 equivalents for the different composting processes. And the greatest amount of emissions ended up being lost from mechanically turning the piles followed by windrow. So these are kind of similar where you're constantly disturbing the pile, uh, followed, by, followed by the static pile with the silo composting having the less, least amount of total CO2 equivalent emissions coming from uh, the three different greenhouse gases that they measured in this study. And just kind of for my own entertainment, I went back and tried to compare what we saw on farm with what they were seeing in the meta-analysis. Uh, they didn't look at ammonia, but our two farms were pretty similar in terms of ammonia losses, and this is looking at pounds per animal unit per year. Our methane was quite a bit different with the large open lot being greater than the smaller open lot, but I think that's because uh, the compost was kind of mature when we started uh, measuring at this facility, but they were pretty close uh, or within the range at least of what the meta-analysis was showing with turning and windrow. And same with nitrous. In this case, our large open lot was a little bit lower than the smaller open lot, but again, pretty similar to turning and windrow, which would be a similar management practice. Now switch gears for the last couple minutes here. Uh, we have this long-term study where we've been looking at the application of manures and composted manure and two different fertilizers, urea and super U, which has inhibitors in it that are supposed to reduce your N2O emissions. And looking at uh, long-term rotation, so the data I'm gonna show right now is the first three years of the study where we had corn followed by barley, followed by alfalfa. And this data here is from the barley year. And just to show that uh, for us out here, we're irrigated. Uh, when we apply manure, the spring manure, you know, you can see a spike in emissions, but we really start to see emissions during the growing season when we start irrigating. So as we start to irrigate, we see these spikes in emissions, and then over time, all the emissions just tend to go down and kind of flatline towards the end of the season. And we're not showing winter emissions data here, but we do have some winter emissions that show as you get freeze-thaw cycles that you can get uh, more spikes in emissions in the non-growing season. But to look overall here, so this was the first year in corn, there's a lot of variability in nitrous oxide emissions, not a lot of significant differences. But by the time that we were the second and third year into the study, uh, the nitrous oxide emissions from the manure sources were greater than from the fertilizer sources and the compost. And I should point out that the compost has such low available nitrogen that we were adding urea um, to those plots as well. 
If we look at that as a percent of total nitrogen applied in the first year under corn, urea had the greatest loss in total nitrogen. Uh, you can see that the super U did its job that year and had a reduced amount of nitrogen lost. And then our manures uh, and the compost tended to be similar to the super U. And in the second year, uh, there were no significant differences, but numerically the manures, the fresher manures had greater uh, nitrogen loss than the other treatments. But if you look at the amount that was really lost, we're talking less than 0.2% of total and applied, which is quite a bit lower uh, than the IPCC default values of 1%. And just the last slide here, uh, we want to do kind of a quick balance. This is not an LCA analysis. We were just looking at the losses of N2O from the cropping system and whether or not we were able to offset that by gains in soil organic carbon with the manure and compost treatment. And you can see that the compost and manures did have a positive effect on gaining soil carbon over time and that that net gain of soil organic carbon in this case was able to offset the nitrous oxide emissions. So we ended up with a net uh, negative global warming potential for the compost uh, and the manure. So uh, just gaining that little bit in carbon, even though the emissions were similar uh, to the urea and the super U, um, we were able to end up with a net negative global warming potential.